Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm Eric Christensen, pharmacist and your host. Uh, today I'm going to be covering azithromycin. Uh, first I wanted to, to cover a, a question um, I, I get once in a while. So the free uh, top 200 PDF, 31-page uh, PDF can be found at reallifepharmacology.com. Uh, I cover the top 200 drugs and uh, really important uh, pearls uh, associated with those drugs and those pearls are often highly tested uh, on pharmacology exams, board exams and things like that. So that's what that resource is all about. I've had that question a couple times now. I get it free simply for following the, the blog. I'll I'll give you email uh, updates as to when I've uh, got a new podcast released is primarily um, what I use uh, your email for. And, of course, uh, nothing else in, in that respect. So um, reallifepharmacology.com, you can get that. Uh, let's get into azithromycin, uh, what you came here to listen for. So this drug is an antibiotic for infection at its most basic level. Uh, the mechanism of action of this drug is that it binds to the 50S ribosomal subunit. And in that process, ultimately what the drug does is it blocks bacteria from creating, from producing um, protein, also called protein biosynthesis. So what that does is stops the bacteria from uh, growing, from replicating, and uh basically getting those essential proteins that it needs. And that's a good thing if we're trying to, to treat bacteria. Now, the uses of this medication are uh, many. There's numerous, numerous infections. I'm not going to cover all of them by any means, um, but I definitely throw you throw out some, some common things that you see um, in clinical practice. So uh, pneumonia is a big one. Uh, another big one that it's a, an alternate therapy. So probably most commonly I see it in um, patients who are truly allergic to penicillin, amoxicillin type antibiotics, um, ear infection, uh, alternative uh, for strep throat. Uh, you may also see it for um, endocarditis uh, prophylaxis, that type of uh, use as well. Um, COPD, uh, there is an indication for uh, short-term use, as well as uh, longer-term preventative use as well in trying to prevent uh, infection and, and COPD exacerbations. Uh, MAC, Mycobacterium avium complex, which is common in HIV uh, AIDS management. Uh, one other one in, in combination with ceftriaxone that you may see in practice uh, is uh, gonorrhea chlamydia infection. So oftentimes uh, those two agents are used together to uh, manage that uh, sexually transmitted disease. Other One other uh, rare one uh, that is uh, prevented by vaccination uh, is pertussis or, or whooping cough. So it does uh, potentially have some activity there as well. So I think that gives you a pretty decent overview of what uh, bugs, what infections are, are covered by azithromycin. Again, not a totally all-inclusive list that I went through, uh, but some really common ones that I've actually seen out in real-life practice. Now, talking about pharmacokinetics, uh, azithromycin is kind of unique um, compared to a lot of other antibiotics. Uh, many antibiotics are dosed uh, multiple times a day, not all, but you think of, you know, your cephalexins, your moxicillins, uh, clindamycin, uh, sulfamethoxazole trimethoprim. A lot of these drugs are dosed multiple times per day, and that's due primarily because of their pharmacokinetics. Azithromycin has a really long half-life, so this drug sticks around in the body for a long amount of time. And with that, that's advantageous where you don't have to dose it quite as frequently. So in a patient that's getting your standard Z-Pack, so that's 500 milligrams for the first dose, and then 250 milligrams for the next four days, uh, that, that drug, that half-life, that's going to last Oh, approximately between two to three days in the bloodstream when you give that, that first dose. So you're only giving that medication for, you know, five days, but the 
use, the activity of that drug because it lasts so long in the body, you know, extends to that seven to 10 days, maybe even plus uh, type type period. So just an important thing to remember. And that's one of the reasons why azithromycin, we can get away with once daily dosing uh, compared to a lot of other antibiotics, which usually require uh, multiple daily dosing. Adverse effects, uh, really azithromycin, I think is pretty well tolerated. Uh, probably the most common thing I have seen uh, is GI upset, diarrhea. So that's you know, pretty standard with any antibiotic. Um, but I will say azithromycin doesn't tend to go to the level of, uh, let's say, an augmentin, for example. That tends to cause uh, significantly more uh, GI upset and diarrhea. Now, I will say with an asterisk that uh, those adverse effects, especially GI adverse effects, are dose-dependent. So if you're giving a, a patient 500 milligrams of azithromycin versus 250, you're probably more likely to encounter some of that GI upset, nausea, uh, and or diarrhea, uh, depending upon the situation there. So that's probably the most common adverse effect that you're going to see with azithromycin. Uh, QTC prolongation is another important thing to think about at least, uh, especially in patients that may be at risk for this already. So maybe they've already got a prolonged QT interval. Uh, maybe they've got uh, hypokalemia or a history of it, uh, maybe a, a lower heart rate, low magnesium levels. Um, maybe they've got a you know genetic uh, disorder or something that predisposes them to that issue as well. So uh, important to think about. Um, I will talk about some other medications when I get uh, to drug interactions and that QTC prolongation risk. Uh, one other thing that I, I have come across, um, again, very rare, um, not very common at all, but uh, some fluctuation in, in LFTs. Um, so again, not really common and you know cases of severe hepatic impairment are rare um, there are case reports out there um, but again usually with an antibiotic limited course of therapy uh, it's probably not going to be more of an it much of an issue uh, i would maybe worry about it a little bit more in a patient who is um, maybe taking chronic azithromycin in that uh, severe copd situation that i i mentioned in in the uses there Let's take a quick break from our sponsor, and then we'll get back to it with drug interactions. Uh, if you're looking for great clinical content, uh, my book, Pharmacotherapy, as well as The Thrill of the Case, is on Audible, and you can absolutely get the link uh, to your first audiobook for free at audible.com. So if you go to meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E, uh, you can find the link to that. If you've never been an Audible member and never had an Audible book, uh, they give you your first book for free. So uh, you can basically get seven, eight hours of free clinical pharmacy content, much like this podcast. And that link you can get at meded101.com slash store. I believe if you scroll down to the bottom, you can find the link uh, to both of those uh, audiobooks and uh, snag your first one for free and uh, obviously give Audible a, a test run as well there. So go check that out. Also on that same page, meded101.com slash store, uh, you can find all my resources for uh, board certification exams uh, like NAPLEX and BCPS, BCACP, uh, as well as the geriatric uh, pharmacist exam as well. So go check that out. Support the sponsor uh, where you can there. Greatly appreciated. And uh, we'll get back into drug interactions here with azithromycin. Uh, so the first thing I, th I do think about is uh, QTC prolongation uh, when it comes to, to drug interactions with azithromycin. Uh, I think of some of those uh, and older antiarrhythmics, uh, amiodarone, maybe a procainamide, quinidine, dofetilide. Uh, there's a... a laundry list of older antiarrhythmics. They are seldom used. Uh, I would say amiodarone is by far the medication, the antiarrhythmic that I see used most often. Uh, but you got to remember that uh, these meds do put patients at risk of QTC prolongation. 
And as we add on other medications to that patient's regimen, uh, this can exacerbate that risk potentially. So that's kind of the first thing I think about. I take a peek, see if that patient's on any antiarrhythmics. Uh, other classes of medications uh, that may prolong QT interval, uh, antipsychotics are a good uh, class example. Um, SSRIs, I would say specifically, I, I do think about citalopram a little bit more so uh, than some of the other agents. On Dancitron is and those class of medications, another one I think of, and uh, quinolone antibiotics uh, are another one I think of as well. Now, the likelihood that somebody's on azithromycin and a quinolone antibiotic, I would say, are relatively low. Um, but I think it, it is important to uh, keep some of those medications in mind that could kind of pile on to that QTC uh, prolongation effect. Thinking about azithromycin and, and drug interactions in general, so azithromycin is a macrolide antibiotic. I can't remember if I mentioned that at the start, but um, within that class of macrolides, there's also erythromycin and clarithromycin, uh, two uh, common agents that you do see once in a while, um, but you don't see them nearly as often as azithromycin. And one of those reasons is erythromycin and clarithromycin have a lot more drug interactions. So azithromycin, as far as the macrolides go, is much better as far as not causing so many drug interactions. And uh, I plan to cover erythromycin uh, and clarithromycin uh, on an upcoming episode because they have some unique uh, clinical quirks and uh, pearls and specific situations uh, that you may see those meds used in. Uh, but with that, azithromycin, definitely less drug interactions than clarithromycin or, or erythromycin. Uh, other drug interactions I, I've you know come across, encountered, thought about, uh, cardiac glycosides, so that the classic example is digoxin. Uh, digoxin concentrations may be increased by azithromycin. So definitely something to think about if somebody's displaying signs and symptoms of digoxin toxicity, uh, which I talked about in the, the digoxin podcast. Um, definitely something to think about if a medication was added like azithromycin that could bump up those concentrations some. Uh, Warfarin is another one I wanted to mention. Uh, not a super, super strong interaction, but if you've got somebody that's got an INR of 2.8, 2.9, and now you put them into the 4 to 5 range, you know, that patient's at greater risk uh, for blood, They're, for bleeding, excuse me. Um, their blood is that much thinner. Um, so definitely something to, to think about there. Um, in the scope of severity uh, of azithromycin causing an interaction with warfarin, um, in no way is it as severe as something like uh, sulfamethoxazole trimethoprim, so that'd be Bactrim, uh, or Flagyl, which is metronidazole. So not as severe of an interaction, um, but definitely something to, to think about. And with warfarin, whenever any antibiotics are started, it's definitely something I think about uh, as far as the risk of, of raising concentrations and something I, I look at anyway. Uh, one last one I, I wanted to mention at, while we're finishing up here is dabigatran. So concentrations of dabigatran can be increased with azithromycin. So as far as monitoring goes, we're going to look out for increased bruising, increased bleeding. Uh, dabigatran uh, is an, an anticoagulant there. So again, warfarin, dabigatran, uh, definitely something to, to think about uh, with those medications and monitoring uh, patients at risk for bleed. That's going to sum it up for today. Uh, if you enjoy the show, uh, leave a rating, review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. That's greatly appreciated. Helps us reach a, a bigger audience, get uh, the message of uh, pharmacology and education out there, which is uh, obviously our, our primary mission here. So um, feel free to do that. Again, that free 30-plus uh, page PDF on the top 200 drugs, uh, free to you. You can get that by signing up at reallifepharmacology.com. All we ask is for an email, uh, no other significant personal information there. So um, you also get updates to when we come out with a new podcast as well. So that's a, a neat thing too. So I'm going to sign off for today. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, take care and have a great rest of your day.